Hey there, guys. This is Dan uh, with Good Guys to Great Men and Steve. Of course, you know. Today, we wanted to talk to you about a concept which uh, is around sex and intimacy, something that comes up for a lot of the guys we talk to. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to talk about an approach which is uh, labeled as being the prize. This is a slightly different perspective on um, how and when and who initiates sex and intimacy in your relationship and how we've got to where we are currently. Lots of guys uh, contact us with this being one of the main reasons that they're unhappy in their relationships. So the first thing I wanted to ask you, Steve, is, you know, being the prize, this is something you introduced me to uh, initially. What is being the prize? Um, being the prize, treat yourself as if, as if you're the prize, is a, it's a mindset. It's a concept for you to realize that your value is, is, is absolute value. Your value doesn't vary depending on her opinion of you. So being the prize is a mindset you have to have if you're a man who's been saying, she just doesn't like me. She doesn't find me attractive. I'm not sexually appealing to her. I don't arouse her. If you find yourself thinking any of those things, those are just thoughts. They're probably not true. What you're probably not realizing is that you are a man of value and that you're using her as a barometer for your value. So to answer your question shortly, being the prize means changing the way you think about your value. So, uh, you know, guys contact us and generally they're, they're, they've been in a relationship where they've been uh, looking to be intimate with their partner and for a long time, um, intimacy has been hard to achieve. Um, and this is because they're coming from a place where they are chasing the intimacy, essentially. Um, and what you've just said is that they are stuck in a position where they're only thinking of themselves as valuable within the relationship because they're looking at themselves through her perception of them. Yeah, yeah. So how would somebody go around cha to change that perception or to change that understanding of their value? Uh, there's two components to it, I believe. I'm going to share the screen real quick. And when you see this on the recording, the picture of this lion, there's a spiritual component to feeling like you're a prize of a man, and there's a, an experiential or an action-oriented component to it. This picture is meant to show the spiritual side, the king of the jungle. She's arguing, she's nagging, whatever she's doing, but he knows he's okay. He knows he's the prize. He knows he's the king. So the, the spiritual side of knowing you're the prize is realizing long before you met women, long before puberty, long before sex and sexuality became so important that it was a measure of manhood, that you were born a prize. You were born king of your jungle, of your own jungle, and that you were worthy. Your social value, your intellectual value, your, your sexual value and your, and your spiritual value were all there. Nobody took them from you. And you get in a relationship and all of a sudden you get knocked, the wind knocked out of yourselves. And spiritually, you no longer believe you're worthy. You no longer believe you're the prize. So this picture is something you could you know, just conjure in your mind that you are that line. You actually are. The only problem is you have a thought that says, maybe I'm not because she doesn't like me. She's not attracted to me. The other component, I say, of being the prize is an experiential or an actionable level of being the prize. A lot of times we don't feel like we're the prize because we're, we're slack, slacking off at work. We feel like we're worthless at work. We're not parenting that well. We're letting our bodies go. We're not, we're not reading. We're having crappy conversations with crappy people about crappy things, and we're drinking a lot of beer, and we're not getting much sleep, and we're eating like crap. Of course, you don't feel like a prize, right? I've been there. We've all been there. How could you possibly feel like a prize if experientially you're not acting like a prize, right? So there's so much. And Dan, I know you know this well in the health and nutrition world. What can happen to your, your self-worthiness and your self-sense of being a prize or not when you're not healthy? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're not healthy, you don't feel confident. You don't feel like you can attract anybody. Um, you, you know, it affects every area of your life. So this is part of what we talk about often uh, in your mojo and your, uh, you know, the balance that you have, whether it's uh, mindset or health or 
uh, sleep. Sleep is essential. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't do everything from a mindset. We spend a lot of time in mindset. In fact, the first component of being a prize is that lion mindset. You have to believe spiritually it's true. It's a matter of faith. But it's hard to keep faith when you look in the mirror and you see that you're not getting enough sleep, you haven't been exercising, and you eat like crap. I, I do this, I get out of the shower and I avoid the mirror, but I make myself look. I'm 56 years old. I know with 15 minutes a day, if I would commit to that, I could turn my body upside down. You know, it would, it would, it would look more like a, a right a V like this instead of... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what gravity makes us go like that. Looks more like a triangle, right? <laughs> Instead of this this carrot, this nice uh, Adonis type body. So being a prize, mindset and experience. What have you done? What have you done to, to action oriented, getting away from the spiritual part of the fact that you know you're you're a good man and a, a great guy? Physically, what have you done to help yourself feel like a prize? Uh, so there's two components to this really. So physically, uh, I have uh, been weight training for a long time uh, and that's something that I found that I really enjoy. It's something that I, I like the fact that you're setting goals that are, are defined by you. So you're not in competition with anybody but yourself. So it's completely up to you as what you do and it's completely up to you as how far you push yourself. Um, and it's completely up to you as to what you get out of it. So that's a great thing. Um, I found it really beneficial for health reasons. I had some trap nerves in my arms and um, being able to research and find a diet that was anti-inflammatory has meant that I've avoided surgery and have able to control those symptoms myself. And that has also had the added benefit of uh, being able to uh, improve my muscle mass, uh, being able to lose fat, so all beneficial things with regards to how I see myself. There is another side though, and the other side is that some of the stuff I was doing, one of the reasons that I initially started doing weight training, other than wanting to get stronger and, uh, uh, and uh, improve my health, was I wanted to be noticed you know, by my, by my wife. And um, this, is, this is that view that we were talking about. You know, this is that. Um, judging yourself, validating yourself through someone else's perception of you. So there's a there's a minefield there as well. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say, you know, you're not feeling like the prize when you're doing stuff like this. If you find yourself overreacting, being taking everything personally, tr hair trigger reactions to things, getting into stupid arguments about stupid shit. You know you're not feeling your, your mojo. You know you don't feel like you're the prize because if you are the prize, you don't get into stupid arguments. You don't need to do that. <laughs> Here's a, another one I'll share with you. If you see yourself uh, feeling like this, this is the avoidance. This is the cowering. This is the you're probably right, dear. Yes, dear. Happy wife, happy life type of 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 mindset and if you feel like this in your body there is no possible way you can feel like a prize i want to acknowledge the real the real the reality here right even if you are spiritually feeling like a prize and you understand your worthiness and your health is good and, and experientially you're having great conversations with great people and you're on a path of finding your mission and you really know that you're you're on a good track and you feel really good with yourself there's a reality that you may have a monogamous relationship in which your partner still is resisting being attracted to you, resisting moving into your space, resisting uh, accepting your advances and initiations of sex and, and intimacy. So, so that's yeah. real. And so in that case, you know, a lot of times we get into that position where, you know, we are pushing more and more and, you know, we're in a good place. So we know we're feeling healthy. We've got the right mindset. You know, we're feeling good about ourselves and yet, something's not quite right still in the relationship. You're still not getting what you think you should be able to achieve in your relationship. You know, you love your partner. So why you look good, you feel good. Why are things not still clicking in the, in the intimacy area? And it's at that point where a man gets clear and calm and realizing what's going on is not about him. When he's the prize and he knows he's operating at the level he wants to, he's meeting, meeting all his expectations of himself, he can finally see what's going on with her is not about him. So he stops reacting to everything. 
and you start seeing more clearly the insecurity, the fear, the self-loathing, the body images, issues with depression and anxiety, her own mojo, her own problems with sleep. How many women have, don't have problems with sleep, right? Uh, her own problems with nutrition and exercise, what she sees in the mirror. When you become full and your mojo is good and you, you know you're the prize, you start seeing things differently, which allows you to talk to her differently, to be with her differently, and to help melt some of those layers of self-doubt and distrust that she has in her heart. That's the only way you can do it. If you try to do that when you feel like a piece of shit, she doesn't trust you. She'll only trust you when she knows you're good without her. So there's another aspect to this as well, which I remember reading from one of your articles before, and that's talking about um, setting boundaries around intimacy that are, you know, we, as guys, we often have this preconception that women hold all the cards with regards to intimacy. And, you know, we have to earn intimacy, you know, whether it's DIY or whether it's making sure she had her feet uh, massage, cooking her a nice meal. You know, we, we, we over here, we call that brownie points. You know, you're earning brownie points to be able to get some intimacy. And uh, I can remember reading, you know, that you were talking about it's time to change that mindset. You know, it's time for you to hold the cards, right. take sex off the table and, and set out some criteria that you have. So what would you, how would you describe that? Well, I describe it first, just like you did. Taking sex off the table and holding your own cards makes you realize that the gift of your sexuality, that your ability to be intimate and close and, and physically um, sexual with somebody is a prize in itself. And you just don't give it to anybody, including your wife, if she doesn't deserve it. You can give anything else you want. You can realize that intimacy isn't just intercourse and orgasm. Of course, as 16-year-old boys, and we bring, 50 years later, I bring it into my life, <laughs> that, that, that intimacy is defined by intercourse and orgasm. It's not true. This is a highly intimate conversation. Giving a woman a foot rub or a back scratch or a kiss on the forehead, hugging a child, petting a dog, holding a cat that's old and, and arthritic, it's all very intimate. And you can take this everywhere in your life. You can take it to work. You can take it to your mom and dad, to your kids, to your pets. And it's impossible to be openly intimate when you're feeling empty yourself. If you feel like getting intimacy, especially in the form of intercourse and orgasm, is the only thing that's going to make you whole, you'll, you'll be tied up, you'll be a mess, and you can't give anything. And if you do give, it will be obvious you're giving in an, an attempt to get back. That reciprocation is your, is your biggest goal. Did that answer that question? Yeah, but I think there's, there's a little bit more to it, and, and that is... So I remember, um, you know, thinking about this myself and thinking, you know, what's a, what's a boundary for me? Uh, you know, I want to be giving and loving and kind and generous and all those things. And I love that intimacy has so many different levels, um, you know, and uh, to the point of I can, I can say going to the mall, going to the shop together is, is an intimate thing. You know, it's fun. It's something that I can enjoy now. Mm -hmm. So, if I was to set a, a boundary, I might say, you know, I'd like to see enthusiasm to spend time with me as, as a, a, you know, a sign that, um, you know, I, I could be the prize I could give my gift to, to her. Yeah. Yeah. So the boundary, let's talk about that word. What would a man do if he had a boundary that he wanted to enforce? in his life around affection and intimacy, how would he do it? And this is how I describe it. He has to start with a value-based uh, notion of who he is. So it's not that I am a man who expects people to give me intimacy and affection. That's not the way you would word it. You would word it, I am a man who creates intimacy and affection in my life, and I spend time with those people who share the values that I have for intimacy and affection. If that's who you are, then the boundary you would set, if a woman who's been consistently distant, dismissive, apathetic, or indifferent towards you, if you're with your partner and she's consistently dismissive, distant, apathetic, or indifferent towards you, the boundary would be, I take my stuff elsewhere. I take it anywhere but with her because she's proven herself unwilling and incapable of joining me in the world that I plan to live in. I'm not negotiating this. This isn't something I'm wishing for. I am a, an affectionate, intimate man. And so the boundary would be to just start distancing yourself, not to play a game, but to go give it elsewhere. 
not to go pout, which is what most of us do. And normally when a woman sees you doing that, taking your already great life, your already intimate and affectionate life elsewhere, she'll either get pissed, right? She'll get threatened and sometimes attracted back to you, seeing that you're living your life unapologetically. And the boundary you just put there was that you don't give to her what she has no interest in sharing with you. But you can only do that when you're full and you can only do it when you've invited her enough times to make it clear that her indifference, dismissiveness, apathy, or distance are, are something that's consistent, that she's stuck in that mode. And if you want to try to get her unstuck, you're going to have to let her know that she's got to come chase you. And if you don't think you're a prize, you're not going to feel like you can get anybody to chase you. And so creating that kind of environment isn't just how is she behaving towards me. It's, it's also a how, how, you know, how have you been showing up in the relationship? So, you know, I kind of uh, think that if you are, setting out some criteria that you would like to see from her you've got to be giving that kind of thing to her in the first place consistently before you can expect or hope or uh, enjoy that kind of energy coming back from her so this might be things like um, trust and respect and uh, compassion and acceptance and love and affection but a consistent energy yeah. of those things yeah, because you're full. You're not, you're not withholding those because she's not doing it for you. It can't be conditional. And some guys will find out after a time of being disconnected and giving their love elsewhere, she'll come around and say, could I get a hug? And she'll, she'll just say it in that voice, could I get a hug? Like, wow, you're never around anymore. And then the unhealthy guy will get into a fight. Well, I've been trying to do that for weeks, and where have you been? I mean, every time we try, no, no, no. When she finally says, could I get a hug? Of course, you're a man who gives hugs. Of course, you pick her up off the ground and you twirl her around and you kiss her on the neck. That's who you are. You don't play games with your affection. And when she comes back and finally says, could, could we make love tonight? Could I get a hug? How about a kiss? Do you want to go to a movie? Those are called bids for connection. Through John Gottman's research, the bid for connection, a healthy man will accept a bid for connection. He doesn't go, well, you haven't been doing it for me. Why should I do it for you? That's the energy that causes the downward spiral that will make you crazy. Again, you have to be full to do it. Don't set boundaries if you're not full. Don't set them from a place of bitterness and resentment. That's a really good point. Okay, I think uh, we've covered everything. That's uh, really useful, really helpful. Thanks very much, Steve. You're welcome. I hope this is helpful to the guys out there. Take care. <laughs>